may the same questions that you re-ask over and over and over and over again in the channels and because why not um anyway so um quick quick note uh, incentives were paid for may today we paid a little over eighty six thousand scp out um it's a pretty good number i i, I kind of kicked around this this idea of maybe padding it this month but decided not to because i think we're we're really kind of in a, a reasonably good place instead i'm gonna say something now it's not an announcement it's just going to be more of a something i've been thinking about for the last couple of days and i think it's probably the right time um but if you joined in december january time frame what you know about the incentives is that well what you should know let me go ahead and explain it correctly so if you don't know you will now um you know what we did back in the day was we had this uh, excel spreadsheet essentially and it just had a calculation and you know what what happened is is that we were paying for just all kinds of weird little incentive type activity just because we were trying to sort of keep people around and interested when it was still very early and we were still a long ways away from delivering any sort of software and and then what happened is as we got into uh you know 2021 we you know finally had delivered at the exa miner it worked pretty good we weren't selling a lot of them you know we were selling a few like eight to ten a week or something like that i don't know what it was but it was a it was a small reasonable number it was okay and it was it was you know it was giving us good valuable feedback and so forth and you know extrapolating the numbers you know we could we could look to the end of the uh, year and come to a conclusion that yeah you know our network was going to be reasonably sized it had grown up from you know 130 providers in 2020 to 300 and some in 2021 so we were styling you know we felt pretty good about things and we knew when we got to launch we'd have a reasonable uh platform to represent to people knowing that it wasn't going to be production ready it wouldn't be big enough to actually take on any real serious customer profiles but it was good and you know so that's where we're at and to keep those people around and reward them for being here you know that that amount of time and 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 supporting us through all those early days when there were some you know real challenges across the board you know we paid them quite a bit of coins and, and a lot of them made pretty outsized numbers of coins coins that make people jealous today because you just you're never getting those kinds of numbers before or that we were given out before and so anyway um what happened was we had this incentive calculation that you know rewarded uh you know folks for used capacity and and back then we were put because we only had those small numbers of providers we could uh you know afford to sort of do a lot of crazy sort of size testing so and it was it was also pretty easy to to make sure we covered everybody so you had all these people that had terabytes of storage on their machines so you know one of the things that i just kind of decided to do is towards the end of the year i said well look you know this is looking pretty good and we're growing a little bit so we want to kind of incentivize that and so let's uh let's freeze the incentives into the end of the year and let's let those people you know kind of enjoy the moment because they you know they worked hard alongside of us so they they, they kind of needed it you know and then you know we had the fawns fine video and the rest of it and it is what it is we we had never prepared for success we just never prepared for that kind of thing because it had never happened for us prior previously so you know um the incentives were frozen and then right out of the clear blue sky the network just vaulted up from you know 300 to 3000 and at that point we had this really challenging pr situation on our hands because it was like you know we did this thing under certain circumstances and conditions and rationale that all got thrown out the window and you know but then to turn around and say well yeah, but we have to change that now because we can't afford to do it for you know and and the network didn't look like it was going to slow down it looked like it was going to go all the way to the sun so you know we were kind of like soul searching to figure out how to deal with it and 
And what we were supposed to do is just put it right back on track to what we originally had planned, which was, you know, to have it tied directly to coin price. And then with all of the providers and everything that were out there and the, you know, the way the the things were going with the coin going up really high and so forth, that would have dropped the numbers significantly. Everybody would have, you know, cried foul and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, we didn't do that. You know, we said, look, you know, this was a mistake or not a mistake, but it was just a missed guess about what was coming. We just had no idea to predict, no way to predict the future. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, but because we understand, you know, a lot of you people came here thinking some crazy notion based on that calculator and based on the way the, the video guys interpreted the calculator, um, you know, we'll go ahead and we'll figure a way out to run the incentives all throughout 2022 on a declining schedule until we get down to a number that makes sense. And then, you know, we'll go to a straight live, you know, uh, thing. And as I've said before, if, if, if coin price is X and we charge, you know, Y for storage to customers, I want to turn over about 50% of that rent money to you guys. Uh, you know, that that seems to me to be a pretty solid kind of you know thought process that that I think will validate out over time. But on top of that is this incentives and the incentives will change and morph and do all kinds of things this year. Right now, the only incentives that exist are used capacity. And, you know, so that that's obviously that declining schedule is really important because that's the only thing we're paying on. We know we have to get these other incentives up on the table quickly. We need to get continuous time and service done. We need to get um, all these other ones that are listed on the incentives page so that we can, you know, then start to really granularize it and allow people to do certain things so that they can enhance their earning ability. Right now, the only way to enhance your earning ability is just to somehow get storage on there. And so we have people trying to game the system. We have people wondering about, you know, how to best set up so that they can you know get more corporate data and it's just you know it's not what we're trying to achieve what we're trying to achieve is a a working flywheel of incentives that causes you to do the things we need so that you provide the best potential network for corporate and sme and 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 you know different kinds of business uh customers so what I'm thinking about right now, I think the number is 85 going to 75 this month. Might be wrong on that. It might might be one to the other side or the other of that, but I think that's where it is. Um, what we might end up doing is we might say, well, so so one of the things that happened, you know, between then and now that's that's different is that everybody here decided to sell off their SCP for some reason. So, you know, when we were like making the judgment, oh my God, this is going to bankrupt us. You know, the coin price was just going, you know, crazy. And, you know, since then the coin price has really overshot to the downside. And that's just me making a personal opinion. Um, I do have quite a bit of trading experience. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. But it overshot. I mean, it, it it blew right through several pretty significant supports. And it's found what looks to be a pretty solid support. It's been flat now for weeks. I mean, it's just been, and, and interest has dropped significantly, which is the other thing you really want to see. I mean, there's almost nobody even is, is, is buying or selling. The number, I think, 24-hour volume, let me look on the BTC pair. Yeah, I mean, it's been down around the 10,000 to 15,000 daily, 24-hour period. It, people have just forgotten about us, which is exactly what you want for a bottoming process to take place. The coin won't turn around if people are still very interested in selling off the minute it pumps up. So, you know, what I sort of suspect is going to happen over the next couple of months is... Um, people will now start to say, oh, you know, this thing's really coming live now. And, you know, the network has been stable for some period of time. They're now on batch two, all these different things. And my guess is you're going to start to see your coin start to go up. Again, to me, it doesn't really matter, except from the standpoint is that we bought a bunch of coins in anticipation that it's going to go up um, because we don't want to 
you know, pay up. We'd rather pay low if we can. And we just didn't think it was going to go much lower. So anyway, that that situation uh, changed and the coin price did come down significantly. So, um, you know, that 75 is now starting to look a little different than what it would have looked like back in, you know, January. So it's quite possible what we'll do is we'll freeze it so right now. The schedule on the website says it goes all the way down to whatever, you know, point one or whatever. Um, what we may do here in the next couple of months is freeze it and hold it in place to to let everything sort of catch up and, and shake out. And then Rhinus and I need to uh, really sit down and discuss how we want to weight the new incentive uh, pieces that we're going to be putting out there. You know, I'm really clear that continuous time and service is going to be a strong multiplier on this thing. So one way or the other, you know, keeping your units online right now is really critical because if you go offline, you know, and we draw the line at something like two weeks or, you know, 30 days or whatever it is, a week, I don't know what it's going to be. But but if you get a big break in there, um, it's going to penalize you. You just need to know that. And so that, that COT is a big, 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 big one. Here, hang on just a quick second. You know, the other one that we're talking about is uh, the geolocation stuff. And this is another one that, that, that we've been sort of wrestling with on the back end. Um, there's been some significant changes out there in how IP location services are working. We're probably going to have to really dig in and spend some money on that to get it done right, um, whether we, you know, implement certain things internally or whether we actually go out and use a service that does it, you know, and my guess is it's the, the latter, not the former. But it's probably not going to be some service that we get away with uh, cheaply. We're going to probably have to pay up to get real serious geolocation that also contemplates VPNing and all of the other kinds of stuff. Because we're now at that place where, you know, if you say you're in the EU, you have to be in the EU. If you're not in the EU and we add you in there and, you know, we say on our website or we say in our SLA or we say in anything that, you know, we're GDPR or we're any of the other EU data center type uh, compliance regimes, we better, you know, damn well be there because if we're not, and it turns out that, you know, we have a bunch of, you know, providers serving from North Korea into, you know, EU, that's not going to be a good thing. So um, that that's a that's a, a uh, incentive that is going to turn out to be pretty interesting. And that one will be re really uh, it'll be an evolving one because it'll be different for different locations. Obviously, you'll learn more in in places where we really don't have much. Uh, action or we need more action because we have more customers that are showing up or because we have partners that are really focused there or whatever, um, you know, you will be adjusting that on the fly and all the time. And so, you know, geolocation could be a thing where you think you, you're supposed to, you know, earn a lot there, but turns out you don't get quite as much as somebody in some other market because of, you know that and and this is kind of like the helium model but at the end of the day it's sort of the 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 reverse helium model in some ways um in that we're trying to sort of grow those areas big time and we're willing to pay up to do it that are spark or sparse or spartan and you know kind of get them in into place at some point we'll be in a place where you know all areas have a lot of providers available to them but for this first six to, to nine to 12 months, there's gonna be a lot of places on the planet where we just don't have any coverage at all. And we need to really go out there and incentivize and getting coverage. Performance and auditability are, 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 are definitely things that will come a little bit later on, but uh, in the initial going, we still have to do a lot of work in the uh, relayer uh, monitoring section in terms of how we're you know turning every relayer into a scanner. So that stuff's coming. Um, Okay, so I want to tell you about something that happened today, which is actually today's a pretty historic day. I mean, it really is. This is this is a, a big, big, big time milestone in the life of the project, and um, it became uh, a thing because of the numbers that we paid out today. So, if you remember what happened back in Genesis Block, so in the very beginning, 
you know, when we forked the software and blockchain over, you know, we did it primarily to service or take up some slack for some proprietary hardware that existed out in the world. We kind of got fucked by the project we came from and, you know, it is what it is, not really get relitigating it now, but essentially, you know, we didn't get the hash rate we thought we were going to get. And pretty quickly we realized, you know what, if we're serious about this, we're going to have to really come up with a good solid plan and strategy of what we want to do. This can't just be a, you know, a coin grab, which I, a lot of people, probably 90% of the people that knew about us or even were involved with us felt we were doing. Um, I never felt that, by the way. When I when I kind of got this idea and and went we went down this path, you know, I always knew that this was real and we were going someplace real. I never, ever once had the notion that this was going to be nothing more than a coin grab. And so we put together a, a software spec very quickly. Relayer development was almost from day one. So at that point, what happened was on the Genesis block, or when we decided we were going to do that fork, we had to determine, okay, well, what are you going to do, you know, as far as the thing? Are you going to come over a block 179,000, you know, which is legitimately, if we would have kept up the legacy chain, that's what we would have done. But the old project checkmated us there and hired some Chinese people to, to take the legacy chain. So we went ahead and said, well, screw it. We'll just start over from Genesis and we'll just have our own you know, project from scratch, why not? And, you know, then we did the the thing, which is kind of an ugly word in, in crypto, but we did a pre-mine. And the pre-mines typically you see in crypto tend to be really ugly. I mean, they tend to be like 50% or greater. They tend to be all, you know, hoarded away by the founders and VCs, and they're all locked up in, in these places where you just know they're just these giant, you know, balls that are waiting to drop on the community's heads as soon as the coin gets any value whatsoever. Um, and that wasn't our purpose. That wasn't our goal. Our goal with the with the pre-mine was, A, we wanted to um, airdrop the old community because we felt like, you know, let's reward those guys and we should get a lot of them over here supporting us. Wrong. <laughs> We, that was that was probably my biggest mistake in thinking that there was some community goodwill we would be able to get out of this thing. Um, second thing, you know, when we built that that airdrop, we said was, well, you know, one way or the other, we'll give them coins, and and whether they support us today or not, you know, in the future when they're when they have a lot of coins, they'll support us. But then we started looking through uh, the deal, and it turned out the old project. Like seventy percent of their entire coin supply, right, was on exchanges. You know, it's like everybody was waiting at the drop of a hat in order to sell because the coin had gone through the big alt season of 2017. So I think nobody um, really wanted to be caught again with coins in a private wallet because if the coin ever ran up to you know what it ran up to over there, and it would have been. Um, it was, I think, 11 cents was the peak. And so um, in 2017, 2018, and then, and then um, that would have translated in us whatever three digits over. So um, what is that? That's $100, $110 a coin or something like that. An insane number, right? Um, so we kind of, you know, we looked at it. And we said, well, that's just nuts. I mean, 70% are in exchanges. So I started sending emails out to... Pitchy Lie over at Bittrex, uh, which is one of their big exchanges they used. Uh, I sent one to Binance. I sent one to, um, you know, pretty much the four or five major exchanges where, you know, Poloniex was a big thing for them, actually. So sent one there. They had just been acquired by Circle. Um, and so, you know, at that point, I, I figured, well, at least some of them would distribute these assets, you know, when the fork happened. And all of them came back and said, no, we're not, we're not distributing anything. You know, so, you know, screw it. And, you know, we asked about being listed at the same time. Of course, they said, yeah, no. So at the end of the day, um, we were sitting here scratching our heads. What should we do? I mean, should we send all these coins and then, you know, have CZ be the, so if he, if he was already worth, you know, $18 billion and he really legitimately in a stealthy way was the world's richest man or whatever, um, you know, would we just be giving him free coins? We would. 
And we said, no, we're not going to do that. So we just decided to put them into a cold wallet and, and just put them off to the side and figure out what we would do with them, you know, later. And, you know, so that's what we did. And, and we ended up with 4.5 million coins post supply adjustment um, in this cold wallet address. And the same time in the pre-mine, we did 1.75 million coins uh, that we earmarked for exchange listings. And then that kind of that money kind of went off over time. We we paid some pretty good money to be on Crypto Bridge. We, you know, we did uh, some other things along the, the way where we paid to get on Whitebit. We, we paid to get on Probit. Um, you know, so so there were there was a uh, an an uh, an address there that held a number for that. We also had another number that was for network development, which you guys, and that was like you know a million something, and you know that was what we've been paying incentives and all of our testing data out over the last whatever it's been three years, four years almost now. Um, and that wallet up was coming to an end. I, I could see it coming to an end um, a couple of months ago, but it finally did uh, come to an end. And, and I knew this month was going to be close one way or the other of whether I was going to be able to pay it or not. And then ultimately, we got to the point where I started looking at the incentives for this for May and, and realized, well, it's got to happen. So here we go. So I pulled out, went to the safe deposit box, pulled out the hard copy of the cold wallet um <laughs> typed in the seed words and opened up a wallet with four and a half million coins in it and if you look in the events channel you'll see that i then sent three million of those coins to new cold wallets to 1.5 million cold wallets which will go up on our website uh address so you can keep an eye on those and then kept a one uh 1.5 something million wallet open which will now become the next, you know, six to nine months worth of incentives and, you know, bonuses and all the stuff that we'll be doing for you guys. So, you know, just to, to, to tie that bow, um, what we decided along the way was that four and a half million airdrop, um, we could have done a lot of things with it. We could have burned it, which was stupid. We could have given it to ourselves, which would have been pretty cool, actually. We could have given it to VCs to go out there and market our coin and give us really huge coin value. We could have sold it to investors. We could have done a ton of things with it. But I've been pretty you know, clear in my mind that this is a really interesting opportunity that we have that somebody like Amazon and Google and, and Azure just doesn't have. We can use this, uh, this treasury, this, this thing very clearly to incentivize you folks to build out the data center, to build out the network. And, and if we do a credible and good job of that, it will stand up a very robust, very sticky, very dedicated and, and, and very knowledgeable and performant and you know, capable and capacity wise, all of the, the, the uh, you know, adjectives you wanna to apply to it. And then ultimately, that's how we build our data center. So I have a spreadsheet that I always look at, which essentially, you know, tells me how big of a data center can we build if we're on the, you know, trajectory we're on right now. And, and you know, it's a it, it's a number that's okay. It's several hundred petabytes at this point, but but you know, how far out can you stretch it? That's the second part of the equation. You know, I, like I could just blow the money right now i could just you know turn it all over and then the video guys would go nuts and say lambos lambos and then the network would explode and we'd have tons of people here but then of course after two months we'd be out of money and then they'd all go away again and the circus would leave town and that's not what we want so i've been very very judicious about how we deal with all this and and so breaking open that cold wallet is a milestone because that means we're now kind of on the downhill run. I mean, we, we're not halfway through the amount that we had, but, but um, you know, now that wallet's open, the clock is ticking. So um, one of the things though, that I think you're gonna see from us is, you're gonna see us start to hit the accelerator here pretty soon. So, you know, we never really follow the rhythms of crypto. We're not really a crypto project if you really get right down to it. And, and so we don't really care what the rest of the market's doing right now. We don't really care about any of that sort of stuff. What we care about right now is we have a product that is just now coming alive 
and we will soon start to see real world customers begin to populate the network. And as they as they continue to grow the network capacity or the network use, the capacity uh, should begin to follow along with it. And one of the things that I think we'll, you'll start to see us do is hit the gas pretty hard as we get into the, sec the third and fourth quarters of this year in terms of growing that 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 data center into a much larger profile network. Um, what that's gonna do for us in the world of crypto, I don't know, you know, cause I don't really know what crypto is gonna do. I don't, I don't know if stocks are gonna go down a lot harder. Like, you know, a lot of people are saying, I don't know if we're about to go on a historic bull run, you know, I don't know, you know, but what I do know is, is that we're about ready to start selling cloud storage in a, a very concerted and large way. So that big cold wallet now is, is live and it's ready to go ahead and, and report for duty. Um, so that's the, the situation there with the payouts and, and the historic day. Um, it's been 1,311 days since Genesis block. Um, as we've said over and over and over again, we're about 87, 88% through the emission. So um, I'm sorry if you didn't get all the coins you wanted to have um, you know, in your own private bags. It's there's just nothing that can be done about that now. You you needed to be here uh, earlier, and you know it just is what it is. That's how it always works. Um, the good news is is that uh, I think with the coin emission where it's at, with the hash rate where it's at, that we have a pretty stable consensus mechanism underneath us. I don't think we have to make any major decisions about consensus anytime soon. I still think we're going to go to POS or at least some blended model of POS, POW. Um, I just don't think that there's any kind of overwhelming pressure right now to really do that. We talked a little bit about wrapping the coin, sending it off onto another chain, probably not Solana since it crashes every now and then. Um, maybe to AVAX, you know, Avalanche is, is an interesting chain. Um, you know, could go to one of the other ones, but uh, could go to Ethereum, even though I know that would make some people pretty unhappy. But the whole idea being that um, when we talk about uh, proof of stake coin, we're talking about the SPFs, we're talking about wrapping those tokens and sending them off to another chain only so that we can generate liquidity, so that we can ultimately have them out there and sold to the public so that it isn't just the insiders holding the consensus generators so that it's a, a more fair mechanism. Everybody has a chance to be involved in consensus um, and it's back to being permissionless and so forth. But again, that's not a decision we have to make today. So you'll hear more about that probably in quarter four. That's probably when, where that's going to really become a hot button. But for right now, it's just sort of so, something that's waiting in the wings and sitting off to the side. Uh, the XM sale, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about it. I know, I know. Look, we've had a lot of things that we've changed on this go around from the first, you know, the first batch. Batch one, you know, we did a pretty good job of it, but there were a lot of, you know, pieces of it that were not very efficient. You know, um, one of, so I've been showing a few of the things we've changed. So we ch we've got some new packing material, new boxes, um, new new foam inserts to get rid of the loose fill. The boxes will be clean and they'll look professional versus the Chinese stuff that we've been getting, you know, that look almost like the units have been, you know, used or something. I don't know. Um, we have a new crypto processor in place that will make that process. I mean, that process was kind of a nightmare matching up transactions. So that's all working great. Um, the integrator is doing great. They're up to speed. So that'll, that's good to go. Um, we expect right now to have about 40 to 60 units ready to go in stock the minute we start sort of taking orders. So the first 40 to 60 people are going to be able to get their units really quickly. We have an order in with the China manufacturer for the chassis. That's going to take about 30 days. So there will be a period of, you know, we'll ship a few, then there will be a little lull, and then we'll immediately start shipping again. And then ultimately, I think, you know, we won't be in any kind of a long five month kind of a window. It'll be a It'll be a two to three month turnaround is is my guess on this this go round, and it'll be two to three months for a significantly larger batch. So um, if it turns out to be a smaller batch because people are really scared to spend money right now, well, then they'll happen a lot quicker. It'll be a lot less than three months. So um, that's really the situation that's on hand there. And let's see here. 
we set up new tax processing because this has just been a nightmare. I have at any given time five or six UPS exceptions where some local customs agent has decided to get into our business and, and determine that they're angry that they have to like deal with us. I don't know why. It's just such a weird thing. But um, you know, essentially we ship something over and 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 you know customers available, we give them an email, we give them a phone number, and you know, then things seem to go squirrely. You know, they 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 turn around, they take our invoice and our invoice says four thousand dollars and they say that our invoice says forty two thousand and they want to charge the customer, you know, some crazy number of euros in order to to deliver it. And then we go to turn it around. This this is a true one, by the way. This one actually happened. We we fought with them for a month to get this thing changed. And ultimately they finally just said, you know, this is what's gonna to have to happen because your customer's not gonna pay the twenty thousand euros that we need on this order. Um, so we're gonna ship it back to you and you're gonna to have to pay the taxes. <clears throat> My UPS rep said, just go ahead and accept it back. We'll figure we'll we'll pay the money and we'll figure out how to deal with it. I'm like, okay, I guess. You know, they brought the unit back. Um and and so now I was waiting for the unit to be shipped back to the United States, and then I get an email from them that they delivered it. <laughs> Where they didn't deliver it to the customer, they delivered it somewhere else. And then they had to, we had to issue a thing for them to go out and pick it back up. And so this unit, I know what's going to happen to this unit because I've seen it before. It's going to go into something that we call in the United States corporate overgoods. It's not coming back to me. I already know that. I've written it off. It's not coming back to me. And at some point, UPS is going to issue me a gigantic bill. And then I'm going to turn around and have to dispute it. UPS is going to end up eating probably thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 on this order because they can't control local customs officials. It's nuts. So one of the things that we're going to do differently this time around, and I, you know, I just, I should have sort of understood this because I've been in this business for a while, but um, things have changed a little bit, but whatever. We'll do all the tax calculations on the front end. When you buy with Bex and Miner now, you'll pay me the, the VAT. You know, I'll collect the money for your queen and give the money over to your queen, you know, so that she can have all the wonderful things that she wants. And the UPS people, all they have to do is just deliver something. And the customs people just look at it and say, it's already been paid. So, you know, that's that's the big, 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 big change that's going to happen on this time. And the other thing that's happening is, is that when we send warranty units back out, those end up in trouble because every single customs agent seems to have a different idea about where they want to see the word warranty on a commercial invoice that shows up in their mailbox. And it's like, you know, I finally concluded because we've had about, you know, six or seven of them that have turned into real nightmares shipping wise. Where I finally just said, you know, look, there's about nine fields on here where I could put the word warranty. I'm just going to put it in every single one of them. <laughs> yeah, that way I can't lose, you know, and, and that's some stuff that we've kind of had to deal with. But all that stuff is out of the way now. Finally, I'm proud and pleased to, to announce that all that stuff is done. And we're finally at that place where I think we can go ahead and, and turn on the live ordering and and let the first wait listers come through and start ordering rigs. It, it, it's taken a while, but you know, all of that stuff was on the plate and needed to be done. So there you go. One last thing on the Exa miners, we have paid about three quarters of the patient's bonus out. We're still waiting for the final units to all sort of come online before we do another payment. And then we're gonna have a long tail straggler group that's just gonna be whatever it's gonna be. We'll have people that will put a unit online two years from now. And they will, you know, email in and say, hey, I finally got my examiner online. And we're like, what? Yeah, it's been in my closet. I just didn't, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we get a ton of this. It just is part and parcel of the whole thing. So when that happens, we'll, you know, we'll pay the, the bonus out, I guess. Although at that point, two or 400 coins is probably going to be worth like $9,000. So, you know, it's going to be like finding a Gibson Les Paul from 1959 in your grandma's closet, you know, so. That's a that's a reference everybody here gets because I'm, I'm I've become pretty much knowledgeable now that there pretty much isn't anybody that doesn't play guitar these days. So you know anyway, there you go. Um, all right, so that's pretty much it for the the news and the views. I do want to talk about um, the relayers and the process and the strategy there, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, the 
the situation is this, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I know I always kind of go over this, but I mean, I want to make sure you guys are all aware and understand what it is we're doing and why, you know, because I, I get it. Um, so look, the, the, the organization has been an engineering organization from the beginning. It's been coders all. Everything that we've done has been to support coding. Every money that we got went to coders. Everything we did went to coding. We 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 cheap out on you know servers and stuff like that because everything we needed to go to to building this you know infrastructure. And then we started to transition. Of course, in December when you melted down the servers, we had to go and spend some more money there and you know put some more money into other stuff. And now we're in this process of looking at a, a complete DevOps, you know, re-architecting about how we actually develop quality code and, and deliver at, with a much uh, higher rapidity than we've done in the past. So that's all underway. And so we'll spend some money there. Um, but what has never really been part and parcel of any of our budgeting has been marketing. Any marketing that's been done has, in, and when I say marketing, I'm talking about the whole, you know, panoply of it. I'm talking about websiting. I'm talking about, you know, social. I'm talking about actual paid marketing, everything, you know, even stuff, you know, like like influencers and shit like that. We just, we've never had a budget for it. Anything that's been done there has just been me doing it on a side hustle kind of a way, you know, trying to, to just do some stuff. And of course, that's why we've had, you know, some pretty, you know, serviceable, but maybe not really wonderful websites. Um, you know, and it's it's just been a situation where none of our budget or attention has gone that direction. But that's changing. Um, I had hoped to actually onboard some investment um, over the last couple of weeks. I did go through a whole process with a uh, fund who seemingly had a really strong interest in, and I thought was a pretty good potential because I, I, I made a mistake with them because I really sort of thought they got it. I thought they understood this thing. And then as I got into talking with the uh, individual about it, you know, it all came down to SCP for him. You know, he, he, he just thought that was the entire value of this thing. You know, equity in the development shop, equity in the network, you know, that stuff was whatever. He didn't really. And I'm like, you know, ultimately it became really clear to me that this was not a deal and, and wasn't going to become a deal. And I was kind of hanging some of our marketing funding on that deal. So at the end of the day, that didn't really come to, uh, to fruition. Um, I have to be a little bit circumspect here in what I say next, because there are some regs about um, marketing, uh, this kind of a thing. So I am not in any way, shape or form, you know, FOMOing you into anything. I'm simply saying, if you meet the requirements of an accredited investor, <clears throat> in other words, if you have like more than two million in assets, not counting your primary house domicile, or you make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, and it doesn't matter to me if you live in the United States or if you live in Zimbabwe, those are the numbers. If you meet those numbers, there is a token sale uh, that is occurring right now that has uh, to do with the staking token that we've talked about and so forth. Um, so if you are somebody who's interested in that um, and you do meet the qualifications, please go ahead and feel free to contact me. And you know we can talk about how that works and what it looks like. Because what I'm doing right now is I'm assembling, I'm trying to assemble a mid-year you know, capital raise in order to fund the next quarter's activities, which primarily have a giant marketing spin up in them, right? We need to really crank up the marketing hard over the next two quarters, and it will really start to show its face here over the next quarter. So um, that's that's happening right now. And as we, you know, work through this exa minor sale, as we work through continued licensing sales. Um, we will have a an upgrade part from basic to full that'll have some sort of rebating, uh, you know, new bonus put in there. Won't be as lucrative as the early birds, but it'll be, you know, good. And everybody's going to want to be on the full license. Take my word on this. So, you know, at some point, um, that'll be a way to help fund some of that marketing and, and get that done. But what we're doing right now is... We started out by saying, well, look, let's put it out there on a thing, get some people in to try it out, some co companies and so forth. 
And I had about 30 names and these 30 names were, you know, Hey, you know, we're using Veeam, we're using, you know, um, Com Vault, we're using, you know, this, we've got all of the, these data pieces that we do. We do nightly backups, you know, blah, blah, blah. Everybody had their own story. And so I, you know, looked through them and I said, which are the most, you know, natural for us. And then I started emailing them saying, okay, we're ready now. You know, you can come aboard and, and we'll put you in a private chat room and, and uh, you know, our internal folks will work with you and we want to get some feedback from you and blah, blah, blah. And they just didn't show up. And, you know, I don't know why, you know, why did, why would people say they were interested and then not be interested? I mean, try and figure out human nature. It's, it's beyond me and I don't care. They didn't show up and it is what it is. And I'm guessing that's going to be a thing that we're going to have to get used to some of those disappointments over time. So what we decided to do instead was we decided, let's just go ahead and open it up. You know, why not? You know, it's, it's going to expose that there's a lot of pieces and parts to it that are, you know, still being developed, things that we know that need to be, you know, really feature complete before we get certain kinds of customers, but which we can definitely onboard other kinds. Like if you're somebody who does backups and archives at your organization and you're a backup administrator and you use Veeam, you know, at the end of the day, that works really great right now. You can spin up a relayer and just run, um, you know, so that's there and that's a thing. Well, what's going to end up happening out of this by opening it up is we're going to get a bunch of people who probably were at the bottom of my list, you know, of the trialers or people that we might not have accepted into the trial because, look, they're probably just going to mess around and use up a lot of time and energy and, you know, I'm not saying they aren't going to do positive stuff, but what I am saying is, is that it might not be the most effective onboarding process for the first 30, 60 days, but whatever, it is the process and, and we'll work with them and we'll get through it and, and we will learn more about our software in that process. And then we will start doing the advertising as, as we get this funding in that we're talking about. And then we'll start seeing a higher grade of, of onboardee. But having said that, there are multiple channels here. That 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 sort of retail channel was sort of where I first thought we would hang our hat to see how it worked out. Well, it didn't work out too well, so that's okay. Our second major one really was what we feel is our major sort of direction. And I didn't want to bring those people and to shake out the product first and kind of make sure that you know, there weren't any really stupid glaring things that we had missed along the way. I don't think there are. I think it's working really good. Um, but the deal is, is that partners. And so we had a meeting with a partner yesterday um, up in the uh, Denmark area. And they're a really interesting entity because they they sell to resellers. So they call themselves a distributor. They're not like even a, they're not a they're not an MSP. They're like, you know, a, a big aggregator that sells to MSP. And what they have is really fascinating because they have the ability to spin up, you know, thousands of relayers. And I think that's what's going to happen. And, you know, and they said to us in the call yesterday as we were sort of going over what we have now and you know, how it's going to sort of work for them and how we're going to handle billing with them and their customers and so forth, is they said, look, you know, the one thing you need to understand is we're not going to do this if it's small. We're only going to do this if we feel like we can take it all the way over the top, you know, with a ton of data. We we don't, we don't, you know, they work with lots of different vendors uh, that are out there. They work with new Nix. They work with, you know, the Microsoft 365 stuff. They have, you know, they have about five or six line card items that are really big. And, you know, they sell a lot of that, those pieces, those units. And, and, so at the end of the day, um, they're going to onboard us and likely take us over the top, assuming it works and assuming we can handle the billing. And the beauty of that is we expect that they will probably onboard a ton of data um, over the course of the next you know, couple of quarters. But the other thing that they're going to do for and with us is help us to cookie cutter a model that we can roll out to resellers worldwide. So other people that are out there in the world that want to step up and be MSP types in our equation, 
will have a model that they can follow along. We already have pricing structures and you know that kind of thing set up. But the next piece is, well, how do you do this? And we don't really have a we don't have a clear cut model for that yet. You know, we've told people, look, you can you can go out and install this on your customer website or on in on your customer network. You can install it in your own network and give your customers access. There you can, you know, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can put the 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 VM up in some service like you know Google AWS or whatever and run it there and have them access it that way. Um, not the the most ideal way from a latency or performance standpoint, but at the same time durability and you know configurability and not needing to do a lot of IT work might be some desirable reason to do that. I don't know, um, but Point being that partners are really going to be the next focus, and I think that's where you're going to start to see a lot of stuff materialize in terms of data on the network. So, you know, the when data question, I don't, you know, I don't even really consider it to be a joke anymore. You know, it's more of just a thing. Look, you know, we've said what's going to happen. This is what's happening, and it will just continue to happen, and you'll see the number do what it does. And by the end of the year, we'll all look back and say, yeah, it's going pretty good, and, you know, so forth. So. So that's the deal there. Um, if you're interested in partnering with us, if you're interested in being a partner, um, that is definitely something we are starting to set up the new channels on. So we'll get you into those channels. We'll teach you. We'll guide you. We'll give you some feedback. We'll give you the plan programs because you will get a different pricing infrastructure than everybody else if you're going to be selling to other you know, users and corporations and businesses. So partnering is really the next bit of marketing that we're going to do. So. That's really kind of the situation. All right, um, that's my that's my spiel for today. If you uh, if you do want to stand up a relayer, you literally can right now. Even if you only have like you know a hundred gigabytes to back up onto the network, it's fun to play with and it does work. And you are actually using the product production network, and there's no charge, you know, so to speak. We don't put any charge out there. Um, to put it up there. What what we are going to monitor very closely, though, if you download a relayer and then all of a sudden we start to see a bunch of, you know, weird data uploading going on, um, you know, we're going to look into it. You can't really do anything there right now because what's available to you on the relayer is a 30-day, 5-terabyte uh, coupon. So you can get 5 terabytes free for 30 days after 30 days, we'll reevaluate what we want to do there. We may do some extensions. We may push it out a little bit. Um, but it's not like you're going to be able to just go ahead and, you know, slam the network with a whole bunch of data that lives there for, you know, two years. If you throw a bunch of data up there in order to pad your incentives, you have to recognize you're going to have to start paying for that data immediately when the coupon expires. And so, yeah, there might be something that happens there for 30 days at a time, but we'll we'll see. Um, I'm not too worried about it. If it looks like our coupons are getting really, you know, um, it, you know, exploited, then we will deal with it as we always do. So anyway, there, there there's a story. It's a it's a good story, by the way, and um, I think things are really progressing. Um, I think we're starting to see internally, we're becoming a bit more of a professional organization. We're starting to move with more process and more procedures, and that's just going to keep happening into the end of the year. And I think, I think really this is, this is our year. This is really our year. And I think, you know, right now we, we, we tweet people a lot. We try to ping people that are bigger than us so that, to, to pay attention to us. And, you know, mostly they still ignore us. They don't care. Um, but uh, this is the year for us. And I think what you're going to see is that second largest network in crypto is about to take center stage because not only is it, you know, as big as it is, but I think we've shown now very clearly it's not a fly by night network. It's not a network build a paper hand, you know, people who are just here to, to do some craziness. It's built for people that know they're going to earn a lot of money over the life of this network by being here early and big and 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 sticking it out. And by the end of this thing, you all are going to make a lot of money. I just you just have to trust me on that. Um, and that's why that network number is sticky. Forty three hundred providers, and it hasn't budged. You know, one bit. Our community is sitting around eleven thousand six hundred in the Discord. That hasn't really gone up or down much over the last several months. So. Um, 
I think this is the new normal, and I think this is our new platform to consolidate at. And the what happens next is going to be the fun one. What happened in December was interesting, but it was kind of painful too. The one that happens next, we're going to be more ready for it. And when we're ready for it, that means we're going to take advantage of it. We didn't take advantage of December, to be frank. We just didn't. We will take advantage of the next one. And the next one's coming. So anyway, there you go. Let me go ahead and take questions. Doesn't look like we have a lot today, so we'll see where we end up. Um, Chocolate Coin Crypto. Or did you just have your hand up by accident? Whatever happened to that Chocolate Rain guy? Does that guy still exist? He got into crypto, didn't he? Somebody's going to come up and tell me about Chocolate Rain guy. What, what, what was his name? I had to die because Fish did a big 13-night run in Madison Square Garden. And they never play the same song in two nights in a row or even in, in, in those 13 nights in a row. They didn't play one song twice and they played Chocolate Rain. So that was that was obviously not a highlight of my life, but OK. But Chocolate Coin Crypto is not coming to the stage. So we'll move on to iFlip721. Come to the stage. Hey, I'm sorry that uh, I have not been able to make it to quite a few of these meetings recently, so I apologize for this question has already been answered in the past, but since the relayers are kind of getting a little bit more popularity, I'm really interested in trying to set one of those up. Um, but a lot of the people that I have connection with, they would require, um, I'm just curious what your roadmap looks like in the future when it comes to um, maybe DoD services and uh, the IL five, and if you have any type of, um, if you have any type of future plans for getting some sort of certification for that, or if you already have it now, because uh, I have terabytes of, of data for customers that I know that, that can utilize that for extensive years due to the retention policies. Yeah, and I think I think what's going to end up happening there, um, we're in the process of having this conversation right now. Um, last uh, couple of meetups, I've introduced you to uh, you know Bob Lewandowski, who's been working with us in a consultative basis to uh, you know talk about bringing aboard some some more process oriented stuff. And what he's actually highlighted is several areas where we can sort of cut to the chase on things like compliance and certification. As long as we're cleaning up our internal processes in-house, we can go out and work with some partners that he's uh, well familiar with and he's familiar with the process. And we have some other people in our, you know, partnering and, and stakeholder team that have some background with the compliance stuff as well. So I really think that compliance for some of the more generic stuff is going to come pretty quick for us. I think some of the compliance for geolocationing, for instance, will be able to happen almost immediately. The compliance for things that are more lucrative and up the ladder, like HIPAA, those are going to be a ways out. The compliance for things in the middle, like SOAP 2, I don't know. You know, that's that's going to be part of the Bob question. And, and at some point, you know, uh, we will focus one of these sessions around that compliance. For now, we just want to get the relayer out there, get people familiar with it, have them say, you know, it would be great if it could do this, if it could do that, so that we kind of like have it feature complete by the time we really start advertising compliance uh, and all of the stuff that's out there. The second piece of it is what we really want to hear is, is the process of standing it up on your gear or your VMs or your configurations clean enough and and is it friendly enough and are you happy with it we have both a windows version and a linux version so it's pretty easy to stand one up right now we have a lot of configurability built into it the developers have done a fantastic job in the the software app that that's around it um but i really still think that what's going to end up happening is we'll release the one use to begin with um, that have the whole relayer interface and the caching, you know, uh, capability configured in, and that will become the runaway hit of our our project. I sort of just really believe this in my bones that by the time we release that uh, hardware-based relayer is when things will really start going crazy. Um, but we're not ready for that because the hardware-based relayer 
really is going to take advantage of a lot of caching capabilities that don't quite exist yet right now. Today, the cache is very cool. It's very intelligent. I mean, this whole idea of erasure coding row by row by row so that, it, you know, if you choose a 20 by 30 or something like that, you know, code set, the, 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 the actual whole amount of data you upload could live on 90 providers because it's row indexed. Um, across this database, which is really cool and really robust. And it's also very, very, very durable. So um, in that world, the, the cache is pretty cool. It just needs to be performant, just needs to be available and, and it works. But the cache can be so much more. The cache right now, you fill up the cache, stuff that's been in there for a certain amount of time gets evicted as new stuff shows up. So it's not a very intelligent cache. We need to get it so that you can actually have persistent cash. We need to have it so that you can have lockdown cash for ransomware. We need to have it so that you can have like cash and lanes so that maybe, you know, one division has higher priority in your company over other divisions. So that cash is really where I think a lot of our energy is going to be focused um, earlier on over things like compliance. But I think compliance will definitely parallel us in there. So I kind of took your question and I ran it in a different direction, but I think it's important to kind of talk about that whole thing. Go ahead. Can I can I ask you one more follow-up for something that you just mentioned in there about the cache yep. machine? So we we did set up a test relayer and we started looking at how the caching is involved with uploading files. So if, if I, I guess I would see it, and I don't know the specifics about it yet, but I would see it in conceptually that somebody's going to, like, let's say, upload 10 terabytes of data and you only have a cache drive for a capacity of, you know, like, let's say a terabyte. I'm guessing the process would be that the files would be uploaded to that cache drive and then in, in, in real time somehow sharded and then sent out to the decentralized storage. So that's, that, I guess, makes sense in that realm that you're uploading 10 terabytes, but you only have one terabyte of cache. Is it the same way coming back down, or do you need to have an equal amount of cash for whatever your customers are going to be providing for capacity, if that makes sense? That's a good question. Caching is bidirectional, so you are going to need to take into consideration that when you actually reassemble pieces for download, when people are downloading files or you're providing URLs to videos or you know, you're building websites or whatever you're putting on to the, the overlay layer, the files are going to be brought down and reassembled on that box and then ultimately, you know, presented to the user in, in, depending on what it is and how it happens. So so there is a, a, a bi-directionality going on there and you are going to need to figure capacities out to sort of take advantage of that. And it's like when you're talking about 10 and 1, if you fill the cache and this is the other piece that we're still, you know, we've done a reasonable job internally for ourselves to kind of see this. And there's some dashboarding in our app that shows, you know, that how full the cache is and how fast it's draining and so forth. But we know we're going to want to provide even more granular detail there because if your network, um, these are like little snowball devices. If you think about it, what happens is, is you're feeding them from your net, your local network. So you're going to be able to load them up quickly you know, over whatever, you know, 1G at minimum, typically higher sometimes. And then what will end up happening is, is your internet connection will then become the bottleneck as this stuff has been sharded and encrypted and now being sent out to the network. And that's where all of the bottlenecks going to sort of happen. You know, you'll be watching your cache drain. And if you have nine terabytes to continue to upload and, you know, the cache is not draining very fast because your internet is not, you know, taking care of you. Um, well, then you're going to have to make some decisions and the decisions can be, well, we have to get, you know, a bigger pipe. We have to maybe get two relayers. We have to figure out how to, you know, be able to sort of do this in a way that, that, that we solve the bottleneck. I don't think for too many customers, the amount of cash size that they have once they hit a certain number, and I don't think we have a, a guideline yet on what that number is, but at some point, it's that internet connection, which is always going to be the limiter. And I think there's, you know, I, I don't think there's going to be too many customers that could take advantage, for instance, of a, you know, 100 terabyte cache, unless 
they have the capability to create persistent cash, right? Stuff that lives there and never goes away or locked immutable cash, stuff that cannot be accessed by the ransomware crowd. You know, then all of a sudden huge cash starts to make a ton of sense. If all it is is just getting stuff onto the network and you don't actually download an awful lot, then a small cache is going to be fine. Uh, but if you do a lot of uploading and downloading, if it's equal, you know, as much as you upload, you download, then you're going to have to sort of double up your cache sizing in order to take advantage of it. So did that answer the question? Yeah, that was great. Um, thank you. Sure. Archer. Hi. Uh, so this is probably off topic. Uh, sorry, I, I kind of came in late. Um, I set my provider up in January. It's been running flawless, and I just kind of forget about it. Every now and then check on it to see the storage, slowly move up to 300 gigabytes. Um, but I generally believe if it's not broke, don't fix it. So wouldn't you know it, I bring my family down to Florida to the beach for the week. And for some reason, I decided to look at Grafana this morning and that thing's offline. <laughs> so it looks like it's been offline since Tuesday and I won't be back until Sunday to check it out and see what's wrong with it. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering, you know, am I screwed? I mean, you could call 911 and tell them there's somebody, you know, a dead body in your house. And then when they get there, ask them to turn the machine back on. I, yeah. You know, look. The, the the bottom line of it is this. I mean, screwed is is not a thing right now because, yeah, you know what? You're you're likely going to run into next month's incentives, and you're probably going to see a number which gives you, you know, seventy percent of what you would have normally got. <laughs> and you know, I'm at this kinda... point in the game, I'm not. I'm really not worried about the incentives. I'm. I'm more worried about it just being up on the network, running. Um, you know, every now and then you mention that there may be a, um, a incentive based on length of service, and um, I guess well, just looking gonna, at that 100 yeah. percent since January got me pretty happy. And now I'm thinking, well, that that record's blown. Well, that's um, not going to hurt you. I mean, I we won't set it small. There won't be like a it won't be like one week offline time blows your continuous time and service up. It won't be like that. It'll be, it'll be a minimum of, you know, multiple weeks and probably closer to something like 30 days, you know, because people have events that happen in their life. Like we had one girl that bought a couple of XMs and then she went in the hospital and it's like, she couldn't get back to do anything. It's like, what am I going to do? I'm going to like penalize her because she had to go in the hospital. You know I mean? That doesn't make any sense. So it, it'll it end up being, you know, two weeks minimum, but probably closer to 30 days that you'll have to actually have some event that takes you completely offline that you don't lose your COT bonus when we put it okay. in place. That's, that's comforting to know. So I guess this leads into the, uh, what, the real question. So I recently did purchase the full license. Um, when that goes online and, and that software is available, um, will people in my situation, um, are, are we supposed to be able to remotely access the, the box and, and, and look into things as long as it's connected? I should, I should call my developers to the stage right now and put them on the spot. <laughs> yeah that's that, that's not that's not funny <laughs> but actually it is kind of funny but um at the end of the day yes the answer is yes but I, I, whether that's me writing a check my butt can't cash <laughs> i don't really know yet i'm 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 praying <laughs> for lack of okay. a better word that by the time we uh get to the end of this month that i have a process that allows you to very cleanly connect a pub key to a license key and i'm praying that we have a process that allows you to remotely access your account on our network and see all your exa miners licenses full basic and exa miner hardware and i'm praying that when that happens you can actually you know cause certain things to occur on the miner like restarting it and so forth whether whether you have things like being able to do it at the BIOS level, though, will be a tricky question. I mean, if if a, if a miner is physically shut off, you know, there's nothing you're going to be able to do from a, remotely unless you Good have point. Like, ser server hardware. But but if the miner's just kind of like maybe in a state where it can be restarted, it's just you know kind of like 
there but not there um or you can you know do something with your router and restart there's going to be a lot of capability built into that to to be able to handle it some of that stuff um can and can't be dealt with so you'll just have to kind of like figure out what you know is ours and what is yours to take care of great okay well hey thanks for addressing it um i will say this i've I've been part of a lot of projects you know, th- throughout this, throughout my journey into crypto and, uh, and other networking type things. And this is the first one I've been involved with where I've actually talked to people uh, directly involved, such as yourself. You know, this is the second time I've been able to ask a question and get an answer. So I appreciate that. And I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. I didn't even yell at you. No, no, not once. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Uh, hey, bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Big poppy. How's Trevor's story working out? Get on mute. All right. Hey, how you doing, sir? I'm sorry. Can you hear that? I can hear what you said. Yep, we can hear you. Go ahead. Awesome. Uh, question. I, I just received my Exxon Miner, and I have not uh, got out online yet, but I was looking for, like, a, I want to say, like, a, a tutorial or such to do it properly i was looking online and there's quite a few different ones is there one that you recommend by chance or something on the discord as well yeah if you go to uh if you go well since you're in discord you can just uh go to the project links at the top of the discord and there's a guide there's a quick start guide and then there's a full setting up your exa minor guide I, I i apologize that is another thing that we did in the beginning that we didn't get a good job on the the pack packaging and that there was no documentation or qr code or you know anything directly included in the boxes themselves and that will be part and parcel of this new shipment that goes out that when you pull an x miner out of the box that that there'll be a a little you know uh sticker or something like that that will guide you quickly to that quick start i recommend everybody go to our documentation to our quick start guide Don't go to the YouTube videos. Don't go out to the other places. Go to our guides. Gord has done a great job in putting together these guides. They do need some revision because we have multiple motherboards now, uh, different backplates. But by and large, the guide does tell the entire story, and that's really where you want to go. So up into the left-hand side of the Discord, there's a link uh, for project information. Let me see what it says, actually project info and then in the project info there's a link to fac project links and in there you'll find the quick start guide and the setting up guide i'm just sorry i did find that thank you so much i appreciate it cool any other questions anybody else out there want to come up introduce yourself First time caller, long time listener. <laughs> no? Oh, wait a second. Here we go. Armed only with a fork and a land of spoons. Come to the stage, sir. Hello there. Uh, hey. Sorry if you already hit on this today. Um, had you had an opportunity to. Uh, send out emails for miners yet well that's kind of what i went over in the first uh, part of the call but uh um what's going to happen by the way is this so i i've i've, I've explained it but um we have about fifteen thousand uh waitlist names and i've moved them all over and so i'm going to just tell you this process because the, 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 i'm going to be very circumspect with this and, and how it actually works so um, what we're going to do right out of the gate, we know we have about 50 units that are going to be sitting there in stock, ready to go. So what's going to happen is I'm going to pull a certain number of waitlist names and send emails out to that 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 sampling. It'll be a, the, the first so many names. It'll be so many hundred names. And I'm not going to say how many I'm going to send out, but I'm going to send out the first number of names. And then I'm going to look at it and see what happens over the next you know, whatever it is, maybe three to five days, probably something along those lines. And what we'll do is we'll get an idea of what the sell-through looks like. If the sell-through is really high on those first ones, in other words, you know, 
for every you know four waitlist names we hit, we get one to two you know sales, and that is a high number, by the way, based on what happened last time when there was a lot of you know interest. Um, then what we'll end up doing is we will make some really strong decisions about component, you know, rushing, you know, paying different kinds of freighting to bring things across from, you know, Taiwan, uh, really upping our game in terms of, you know, staffing up our integrator, doing things like that in order to sort of, you know, ensure that we don't get into a five month long, you know, window. You know, I, I look at these other projects and I, one of the things I was always remembering that people would say was that they had miners that they were waiting for for over a year. And I don't know how a company could have got into that situation. I, I understand five to six months because you, you just kind of see how long it takes things to get from one part of the world to the other, how long it takes to manufacture things and so forth. But a year, <laughs> I don't understand that. And I, I and and you know we'll never get into that kind of a situation. We just won't take that many orders. But but yes, um, those names are about to go out. We'll do a, a test run, quote unquote, early on. And if you're in that first early batch, then you will get a miner really quickly. And then after we kind of know what the story is, then we'll open up the fifteen thousand and we'll see what we end up with. Um, if all fifteen thousand end up ordering a miner. I, I don't. I, there's no way that can happen. But if, if they do, my guess is we'll cut the numbers off. We we won't take yeah. that many orders. Batch two will cut off somewhere between three and five thousand. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for the info. Thanks. Do you see? Hey, how you doing, Foster? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Um. Just really a quick question. I know you mentioned um, a few meetings back that you guys are working on sort of that roadmap, kind of listing out all of the initiatives for the project. And I know, you know, on many of these uh, talks, you've gone over a lot of cool initiatives. I was just wondering, you know, when will that be available on the site so that we could take a look? Because um, it's it's really awesome just hearing about the different initiatives, but just trying to see where it, you know, falls in line and the roadmap, that would be great. You know, the answer to that is, is that we do have a roadmap and it's a roadmap that we follow internally. I mean, we, we have an internal punch list that we're working through of things that we need to do. The roadmap that you're talking about is a marketing tool. And I totally agree. It's, it's something we should do. And, and I think it's definitely a viable, valid, you know, useful tool to put out there. I think to, the problem with roadmaps for most projects like ours is that most projects that put up roadmaps never live up to them. You know, they just don't. And and they cha they pivot, they do all kinds of things. And so, and I think if we would have put up a roadmap, you know, in a year and a half or two years ago, well, we did and we didn't hit it and we, you know, changed our strategy to a degree. And so it didn't make any sense to really rush to get another one out there. But I think we're now in a place where putting a roadmap out there actually will work because I think... I think we now have a pretty formalized path ahead of us. We know uh, that our target is going to be to do archival, and so there's a lot of stuff that we need to flesh out there. Um, we know that there's you know hardware relayers. We know that there's certain things that the software licenses need to do. We know that there's this thing called a stateless relayer, which is really key and critical to the project. It's the first you know major step beyond getting these relayers out there to through decentralization and also agro algorithmic CDNs. So yeah, I, I I I mean, look, the roadmap is in my head. But at the end of the day, once we start getting that marketing budget out and working, and once we start putting the website in shape, website's just a bunch of dead links right now. Once we start getting it into shape, that roadmap will be a, a pretty good key of it. So yes. Answer is yes. I don't know why. Every, how come everything I say takes me like 8,000 words to say? I mean, I should have just said yes, right? Yes. It's all good. I, I love hearing you talk anyway, so it's cool. <laughs> no worries. All right, man. That it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, okay. thanks. It's like we made it. Did we go over an hour? Yeah, we did. About an hour and 20 minutes. All right, guys. Uh, 
Um, great hosting you again this week. And if this time works out for you, drop a note in the, the events channel. Um, Discord did introduce a new thing, which is text on voice channels. For some reason, it's only available on the regular voice channels right now. It's not on these uh, stage channels, but I think that it'll show up here in the next uh, some time frame, whatever. Discord's really starting to turn more into a working business tool in a lot of ways. And I think getting text in these events uh, that you can see without having to go to a different channel or window and type will probably become a very valuable, interesting uh, capability. It doesn't exist right now, but uh, um, I'm going to keep an eye out for that because I think you guys will, you'll probably be more um, interested in typing in your questions and coming up and forgetting how to unmute your mic and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, um, good call. And if uh, anything comes up, you know where to find us and try out the Relayer if your business is somebody that can use backup services and archival services. If you're a partner and you want to sell services, definitely contact us. Now's the time to start getting organized into that group and getting into the private channels that we'll have set up for those. Um, you know, otherwise, just keep doing what you're doing. You guys are great. You've built a great network. It's a solid network. It's the best network in crypto of any. I don't even care if we're talking about non-storage. It's the best network in crypto. The fact that we just went through a major bear downturn cycle and it could continue on and you guys are all still here really grinding hard just really says the world about you. You're all great character individuals and we're really grateful and lucky to have you around. So thanks a lot and we'll see you next week.